Oops. Okay. And what do you guys see right now? Just me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Just a sec. You see what I'm looking at now? Yes. Yeah. Up the landscape. Great. Um, okay. Um, all right. Let's talk about the next assignment. Um, I am going to include a few artists that some of you talked about during your artist presentation. So that's kind of fun. Um, but we will talk about the origins of landscape as um, sort of the, the purposes, the sociological and sort of cultural purpose of the landscape. Um, and then move into sort of how it progressed into uh, the digital landscape. Um, so some of the earliest known landscapes that we have are actually in um, ancient Greece. And believe it or not, the ancient Greeks are, you know, in the ancient world, they were not just known for their sculptures. If you know anything about their marble sculptures, those were actually heavily painted. Uh, they were called polychromed. Um, and the reason they're white today is because the paint wiped off. But, you know, throughout the ancient world, they were known for their facility and their mastery of paint. But because it, you know, it didn't survive, that's not what we talk about today. So what we've got here is called the flotilla fresco, which is basically a sort of waterway. Um, so it's a waterscape. It's a seascape. Um, and it's it's one of the oldest ones found, 1600 B.C., um, and it really does showcase ultimately the sort of trade as well as the sort of, um, you know, Navy and sailing uh, practices of the ancient world in Greece, in this region, Santorini. Um, and we also have some from ancient Rome. Uh, the Romans did a practice in their interiors where they wanted a kind of, we, we call it trompe l'oeil. It's not really faithful trompe l'oeil. Trompe l'oeil means to fool the eye in French. Um, and these were meant to kind of open up and broaden the space architecturally. So where there might be a building without a ton of windows, artists would be commissioned to do frescoes to make the space feel bigger. And if you don't know what a fresco is, it's actually done on wet plaster. Um, so it literally becomes part of the wall. One of the most famous is called um, the Nile Mosaic of Pelestrina, um, done in the first century BCE. Um, it's a late Hellenistic mosaic. And, and it, you know, most of us know what mosaics are. It's just, it's broken tile or broken pieces of glass that have either been laid into a floor or a wall with um, grout, right? Um, and this is showcasing basically the Nile, the Blue Nile in the Mediterranean. Um, and it was a part of a, like kind of a sanctuary grotto, right? And grottos were used for a variety of reasons, um, but ultimately, you know, it was a sort of entertainment, um, a kind of decorative motif. And this is, you know, in central Italy. Uh, and this arch form here really does identify its original location as flooring to that grotto as a sort of like alcove, like a cutout, right? And it shows uh, to the Ptolemaic Greeks, like ancient Ptolemy, right? Um, and if you don't know, um, you know, uh, what was her name? Cleopatra was a Ptolemy. Um, it also shows the Ethiopians um, and they're doing sort of like hunting um, and, and various animals of the Nile River. And it's one of the first instances that we have where um, it's a celebration of abundance and what the landscape can kind of give. So it's really a sort of grateful, um, decadent motif that is a showcase of the wonders of water, but also the usefulness of water. Later on down the line in the 19th century, what we've got are essentially what we're calling romantic landscapes. And romantic landscapes are not what you think. Uh, when I use the word romanticism in relationship to our history, what I'm actually referring to is um, drama. Um, the romantic landscape was meant to showcase the romantic tone of the time being really, really epic, violent, hypersexual, very, very dramatic. And what you're seeing here is actually a shipwreck. 
And you're literally seeing people and animals um, going down in the water in the upper foreground. Um, so these are not meant to be sort of saccharine, sweet, you know, lovey-dovey images. They're meant to be incredibly dramatic, essentially the equivalent to um, like a soap opera today. Um, and that brings us to the sublime landscape. Um, and the sublime landscape, that has been also a misadaptation in terms of term usage as well. Um, the, def the, the definition of sublime landscape is actually having such a quality of greatness or magnitude or intensity. Um, and that can be manifested either through like a physical, a, a, a metaphysical, a moral, an aesthetic, a spiritual meaning, or our ability to perceive or comprehend it as, as just sort of overwhelming, right? So in short, the sublime landscape is meant to remind you of how insignificant you are as a tiny human being in the universe, right? And of course, you can fold in sort of philosophies of God in relationship to that, like you are tiny, a speck of dust in the infinite, you know, possibilities that is the creation, right? Um, and the theory was really developed by a guy named Edmund Burke in the 18th century. Um, and he defined sublime art uh, that really refers to the greatness beyond all possible calculation, right? It cannot be imitated. Um, and what you're seeing here is a Frederick Church painting. You also see a shipwreck here. So in the immediate foreground, if you could see my, my cursor, uh, is a mast. And that is a ship that has been frozen in the um, in the ice in the Arctic. This also folds into the notion of manifest destiny. Who in here knows what manifest destiny is? Somebody help a sister out. I don't really remember like the exact definition, but yeah, it has to do something with like the the Western expansion of the the United States. Good. What else do we know about manifest destiny? I, it was this thing in uh during the, uh, the era of the west uh, of like the western expansion of the united states that essentially was like a mindset of it is god's uh, god has given us the right to take over the re uh the rest of the country or the rest of what would become the country yeah the country and then the world it's also a sort of colonialist mindset as well if you if you plant your flag in it it's yours um, what you're looking at here is Niagara Falls. Um, and these are generally really, really big images that were used to sort of provoke and instigate this interest in westward expansion. Um, it was to get people beyond the colonies to cultivate, uh, you know, a sort of American ideology beyond the the confines of, of those colonies. But it was also something that was really uh, sort of decadently uh, uh, dalliance in Europe as well in the 18th centuries. It was at its height, though, in the 19th century in, Amer in the Americas. Um, this is Caspar David Friedrich. Um, and, of course, the broken ice is moving. And again, we see another mast trapped in the ice. So this is meant to be sort of terrifying, right, guys? Like the landscape here becomes philosophic, right? Later on in the 19th century, we moved away from the academy and you've got the Impressionists who are actually much more interested in the temporal nature of the landscape. What do I mean by that? Well, you've got Claude Monet going out and about and creating like five paintings throughout five hours of the day at different times. So he's creating images of the exact same thing over and over again and just swapping out the canvas every hour or so in order to capture the light and how quickly it, it changes, right? In a way, one could argue that these paintings, uh, this whole movement of Impressionism and trying to follow desperately the passage of time through vision is a kind of remembrance of your mortality, right? All painting and art is a remembrance of your mortality, if you really want to get down to it. But he was especially prolific in that. So he was doing like the Rouen Cathedral again and again and again, this sort of like uh, encyclopedic vision of time and seasons and light. And then we move actually into the romantic landscape. John Constable is the guy in England. Uh, he's quoted as saying, and I've never seen, I never saw an ugly thing in my life. 
For let the form of an object be what it may, light, shade, and perspective will always make it beautiful. And this is an example of romantic landscape that isn't that that is dramatic but not dramatic in the way that like people are dying and then photography is invented and this is known to be the very first photograph i may have mentioned during the photography lecture that um this was actually discovered about like ooh, i think like if i remember serves me correctly like 50 years after the what we thought was the first photograph uh, was discovered or not discovered, but showcased basically. And it was found in the back of a closet. Uh, it's in Texas. You can go see it. I've actually seen it in, in Austin. Um, and this is the very first photographic image. And it's of course, outside of the artist's studio, the artist's studio who used to be a painter, by the way. So what does it showcase? It showcases, um, it showcases the landscape as a city, right? But as an uninhabited city, because photography's limitations were that it couldn't actually um, it couldn't capture movement at that point, right? This is a long, long exposure, eight hours. So let's talk about the functions of landscape as a genre. And these are just a handful, right? They can have religious or mythological sim symbolism. And if you want to take a quick, it would really mean a lot for, for me if you took a quick screenshot of this, because I'd like to kind of quiz you at the end. It'd be kind of fun about how landscape has evolved. Take a quick little screenshot of this with your phone and that would be helpful. Um, so religious or mythological symbolism, especially as it relates to the loss of relationship to God, especially if we're talking about the sublime, it can also relate to the cultural identity and nationalism. Uh, we see a lot of those if we go to DC in the museum there, um, you know, Washington crossing the Delaware. So the Delaware River and the landscape itself becomes a character in order to have and evoke a conversation relating to patriotism. Um, it can also be documenting and mapping. So it can be sort of very functional, um, simply what is seen before it changes because the landscape, as you know, is always changing. It can also be a marker of scientific exploration. Uh, it can simply be beautiful as an aesthetic appreciation, right? I live in the Hudson River Valley and it's gorgeous. Um, and a lot of the sublime landscapes actually took place there. Um, I go on a hike regularly a couple of times a week that actually is a view that uh, the sublime landscape artist painted. It can also be used for education and enlightenment um, to basically showcase like the way the world was before it changed um, historically. It can be a political commentary, especially if what we're talking about is something like a hot button topic like um, global warming or pollution or overdevelopment or uh, a loss of humanity in a space, uh, a loss of one's relationship to the environment. Um, it can also be a, a kind of escape. If you think about Bob Ross, right? The painter, Bob Ross, Happy Little Clouds. Mm -hmm. um, his are essentially a kind of escape, right? It's meant to be a very uh, holistically comforting image. It can be tourism, um, especially if uh, what the government is trying to do is sort of politicize the landscape. If they're, you know, if China is producing a ton of greenhouse gases, um, their government in, in all reality, and I've seen a lot of it, is on TikTok producing a ton of videos that are essentially about the bucolic and pastoral landscape uh, <laughs> that the very, very poor live in. So it can be propagandistic as well. Um, and then conservation, which of course, it can also be about urban planning and design. Uh, personal expression and exploration, and artistic innovation, all right? So the first artist I want to talk about digitally is a guy named Beeple. He goes by Beeple. His name is Mike Winkleman, and he's probably one of the most prolific digital artists that is living today. And I think it would probably be fair to say he is. Every single day, he produces a either a video or digital still, like a, a digital painting, um, that he makes in that day. And they are incredible in terms of their technical technical facility and how he's able to, to kind of manipulate 3D modeling software. A lot of what he do, is doing is a, is a kind of combination between 3D modeling software and, uh, you know, Photoshop. Um, and these are some of his examples here. Um, and stylistically, obviously, he's been doing that for 10 years, a little longer than 10 years now, maybe closer to 11, every single day for 11 years. And what has happened is you've been able to see how the work just sort of dramatically changes from one body to the next. I'm gonna show you a little quick video.
Oh, I don't have that as a hyperlink. I will just bring up my little thing here and share it and move it. It's not just with watch an ad. To look good. Sorry. It's built to command attention. The fully electric. So this is people making uh, an artwork in a day. I'm just going to kind of skip a little bit. And then he moves over into the sort of lighting. Addressing the values and the general structure of the volumes, believably in space. I'll just kind of fast forward here so we can get to the final piece. And that's Beeple. So um, why did I show you that? Well, so his endeavor, I think, really is, and we'll get this moving here, his endeavor really is prolific. Um, and it's that kind of, I think, commitment to getting your work out there that really became something else. Uh, he's one of the only people who made, I think he made like something like $140 million off of his own NFTs. Mm -hmm. And if you if you follow the news, no one's making money on NFTs. In fact, people have lost a lot of money on NFTs. Um, and it ended up being a kind of um, a kind of gold mine frenzy. Um, but the reality is, is, is who he is and what he's done throughout that NFT craze really does sort of evoke um, something that is critical, that is political, and that incorporates the landscape in a way that is really asks questions about our responsibilities to technology and each other. Um, so when you look at his work, even though there's quite a lot of figuration in them, they are pretty darn, um, I think, uh, apocalyptic. Feng Zui is a Chinese uh, artist who is a kind of concept artist dealing with the same sorts of software. Um, and these are gaming software that really, it, it, we could call it 3D modeling, essentially. Um, VR software and gaming software in order to create these sort of really, really epic monumental spaces that are used as um, essentially the, the sort of character of landscape in immersive narratives. We've got Victoria Ying, who is more of a traditional, um, I think, illustrator. Um, and these are very, very narrative, um, very, very doable in terms of what you're getting access to um, with both Illustrator and Photoshop. Um, but what's beautiful about her work, I think, is how, how masterful she is with color. She has such a really, really wonderful atmospheric understanding of color and light um, that she doesn't need to do a lot in order to render a very believable environment. Uh, then we have Stein, Simon Stallenhag, um, who really is about the dystopic. So to you, what does dystopia mean, guys? Help it's me out. Kind of like this image where it's like um, post-apocalyptic, like very, like everything's wrong in a way. I don't know. So what is apocalyptic to you then? Let's start there. Like all the dilapidated buildings and like the 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 sunken atmosphere like everything's very gray and they're wearing like suits with tubes is the apocalypse like could that be something that's literally happening happening right now where do we see apocalypse like kind of scenery in our lifetimes palestine 
Yeah. So, you know, like as far fetched as science fiction really seems, art is folding in possibility based on reality, right? So these commentaries are not just commentaries folding in um, the expectations of what could happen. They are based on what humanity does to each other. And so the landscape can be used as a means to really ask ourselves the big questions about our responsibilities to each other. Um, and it's art that's doing that. And I think that's that's really, I hope that you all are mindful of that as you move forward as in thinking about your own identities as artists and the kind of impact that we can have as we create these sort of playful dalliances that are ultimately a fantasy, but really rooted in um, a meaningful reality that is what we're witnessing right now um, and have wars, wars in every generation. Um, Alex Roman paints these digitally. Um, they are completely architectural. So he works with architecture firms and, um, th and I'll, I'll show you a quick video of his as well. Um, in order to create these incredible renderings. Um, and these are not AI generated. They are not um, amalgamations of photos. They are really just simply painted. So I'm going to show you a quick video of his as well. I think he's just the second video I'm showing today. And these are all digital paintings, y'all. I'm going to stop that right there. Um, all right, move that over. So that's Alex Roman. Um, and I think he's he's a really good person to think about if, you, you know, I mean, he doesn't fit within the sort of conformed expectation about what someone would be dealing with in a landscape, but they really are just technical marvels um, and take a long time to do. You'll notice that they're very, very cinematic as well. Um, and he obviously is creating um, animations with these with the software program that he's using as well. Marco Bucci is a sort of, um, I, I keep saying sort of, ugh. Um, he is a, a very traditional uh, illustrator who really is trying to evoke a painterly look with his digital media in order to create a sense of touch. Um, and I, I do think he has some traditional training because I, I don't think you really work in this manner without really running to try to sort of push uh, the notion that, that, that these really do feel like tactile objects. Pascal Campion uh, is a Spanish um, illustrator who really is, is wholesome. Um, we don't see a lot of that, but sometimes we do see it in, in illustration. Um, in terms of the commentary, um, I think really he's, he's talking about humanity's connection to 
uh, the world in general, but the world isn't really the feature. The world is the um, is the stage. Rebecca Mock um, is also a traditional illustrator dealing with the digital. Um, she's really interested in uh, interiors, but what I think why I included her in in thinking about architecture and landscape, obviously the interiors, but is her mastery of light. Like the light is the counter to this sort of dim, very, very boring scapes that becomes these sort of worlds within a world. And here's more of her work. I included a little GIF, two GIFs. So this is a very simple GIF that she's done there. And then just the rain and the cat licking itself. Why am I throw showing you guys GIFs? Well, because your last, your very last assignment is going to be a, either a repeating GIF that you just uses a few images, kind of like this one here, uh, or an animation, a longer animation, if you uh, deem it appropriate. This is Tim J. Reynolds, also goes by Morger. Um, and these are sort of these floating, very playful, um, almost abstract islands. So the landscapes don't ex actually exist on Earth, right? They're existing as um, as almost like spaceships, right? In a sort of um, ether, if you will. Mikhail Sharoff is actually known for his illustrations of cars. Um, very like sort of traditional um almost advertising based uh, illustrations of cars. Uh, for those, maybe Pam in here would know who that was. Pam, do you do you know who this is? No. It's Max Headroom. Oh, I didn't <laughs> recognize <the> him. <laughs> yeah. Uh, he was a character in a, a short lived series in the eighties that was a talking head on a television screen that was basically a facsimile of AI. Um, and here we have him living in the future, right? Um, other images of his are a, lo a lot more cinemagraphic uh, mm -hmm. or cinematic um, and really are about the cityscape. Karen Singh. I like I like Karen Singh a lot. He is, a, I believe it's a he, I don't know. I've been seeing a lot of their work uh, it, that has been promoted by Illustrator. You'll, you'll note like over the summer there was, um, oh, somebody's entered the reading room. Um, You'll note that one of his illust or her illustrator, I have no idea, uh, illustrations was used for the Adobe Illustrator suite. And the reason why is there's a real understanding of simplicity of form. So they can either be like, you know, this is a very simple feature that if you if you really want to go down a, um, a wormhole of tutorials, this is a three-dimensional, it's a new AI uh, rendering that you can use in Illustrator if you want to sort of venture in on it. But ultimately, you know, they're they're basically producing very, very simple illustrations, very similar to this, which I think is really appropriate if you're thinking about the very next assignment. Super appropriate, very simple. You can do it all with a line and closing in shapes and then just doing the fill um, with, no, um, with no stroke. This is Andreas Rocha. Um, an Eastern European artist who is uh, obviously, you know, really uh, interested in concept art um, and heavily evoking that kind of aesthetic in all of all of his work. Romain Tristam, not sure how you say it, Tristam, Tristram, no idea. Um, but this sort of real simple stacking. Um, he also works for an architectural firm and as a freelancer for architectural um, illustrators. And some more of his work. Really beautiful. I think what's nice about what he does is um, he's really using simple shapes. If we zoom in, he's really using simple shapes and the gradient tool in order to create this really evocative sense of light. Um, but really the drawings themselves are not terribly difficult at all. I mean, really look at how simple that is. Um, but they do have multiple iterations. Y you can find a video of his work, again, Roman Tristram. Um, you can find a video of his work, him creating this one um, on YouTube if you're interested. Lots of iterations. Ian McHugh. Um, I love these. Uh, I really dig these. I love the sort of like shape uh, amalgamation that creates these these um, gradients. There's just something really lovely about that. Mm -hmm. um, and to a painter like me, 
um, trying to get this back here um, to a painter like me, that's really quite difficult to do as you anticipate the, the changing of color and value. Um, oh, I don't think I include, oh, that's the same artist. Yeah. Ian, uh, Ian McHugh, same artist. Um, so now we're dealing with sort of fear, feature caricatures or characters as robots, uh, a floating ship here and some sort of, um, some sort of, I don't know what the heck that is. <laughs> it's fun though. Um, a coal price. If we're thinking a lot about the sublime landscape, what would we call this? Uh, if you bring up that screenshot that I asked you guys to take a picture of uh, on the purposes of landscape, what would we say coal price's work is, his function is? I would say aesthetic appreciation maybe. Oh yeah. Here's another one of his. Oh, sorry. I didn't include another slide of his. What else? So they're very beautiful, right? What's this? Is that the way we want the world to work? Look? No. What's up here? Do you know? It's a spaceship, y'all. So one could also say that they're fairly apocalyptic, right? It doesn't look like a friendly um, encounter. Um, this one here is very evocative of those Frederick Church images that I showed you uh, earlier of the sublime landscape, right? They're kind of terrifying. Mm -hmm. Look how tiny the people are, right? So that function there is meant to really sort of elicit a kind of danger, danger, you know, fearful um, kind of space. Noah Bradley, also apocalyptic. We've got these sort of creatures walking in this sort of desert landscape that has this tiny little fire that clearly some tiny human has started, right? Which is evocative of hope. It's the only warmth in the image entirely. More Noah Bradley, same artist. Um, this is actually uh, uh, based on a Whistler painting of men at sea uh, when he lived in the islands, a painter, a watercolorist and uh, oil painter. And then Vitali S. Alexius. Um, this is an artist who, who works entirely in gaming. Um, and these spaces are all about, um, I think, the drama and really sort of difficult um, expectation of toxic, you know, the toxic apocalypse. Victor Enrich um, uses found or taken photographs, probably he takes them himself, and then modifies the buildings so that they become impossible. Um, and they're incredibly believable. Um, he understands light, he understands form, he understands volume very much the way a painter would, having done a lot of observational work, clearly, um, and really just sort of makes these sort of playful, strange landscapes that are ultimately about. Um, buildings becoming uh, sentient, right? They have a, a personhood under themselves. And that brings us to our assignment, which we're dropping it like it's hot with brutalist modern architecture. That is your campus right there, except it's not. It's a whole movement of architecture um, and it's called brutalism. It was uh, really, really popular in the uh, 60s, I'd say early 60s and onward. Um, and it was picked up, uh, believe it or not, really heavily by the communists in Russia. In fact, there's a, uh, I think I didn't include it, but, um, oh, I did include it. Um, brutalism is, 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 it looks sort of like this, right? Um, it is very boxy and this is our campus, right? This is our art building uh, a long time ago. You know, I think this is maybe in the seventies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's not changed much, right? Um, and brutalism is very, very hard to tear down. It's very, very linear. It's very boxy. It's very much about cement. It's very impractical because it is, it, it, it's very hard to maintain. So while it's almost impossible to knock down, it's also something that has a lot of deferred maintenance costs because it holds in moisture. If you know anything about um, the history of architecture, um, concrete was actually invented by the Romans and they perfected it, y'all. They absolutely perfected it, which is why we still have those structures today.
which is why the Colosseum is still standing. The Colosseum is not made of blocks, it's made of concrete. But the difference between our concrete and their concrete is A, they used finer ingredients and less, and they didn't use steel. They didn't put steel rods in for um, support because the Romans observed the rule that if it was taller than, um, if it was taller than three, they didn't really ever build beyond three stories because it, it stopped being very, very stable. Uh, which is why they use so many columns, which is a post and lintel kind of approach. So this is why you don't see these kinds of buildings in ancient Rome. Um, the reality is that when you put steel in concrete, steel moves and changes with um, weather, right? It retains cold in a way that concrete doesn't. And so that vastly different temperature as it touches creates a kind of rust and then degrades the concrete very, very quickly. You can see that very easily if you're looking at like a parking lot and those little things that require that stop you from running over, you know, an edge. Um, it's the the first area that it breaks is where that steel rod is, right? Um, so who are we looking at? We're looking at Paul Rudolph. And Paul Rudolph was the architect of UMass Dartmouth. In fact, he's internationally known for that, your very campus. Um, born quite early, 1918, died in 97 um, in New York. And he's... I mean, really considered to be one of the most important modernist architects. Um, he, in fact, my one of my architect friends was like, oh my God, you're on UMass, UMass's, uh, UMass Dartmouth's campus. Holy moly, Rudolph. But really, you know, it's essentially about units for him. The stacking of um, geometric forms that are ultimately vertical again and again and again and again. Um, but brutalism is not something that's died out. It was heavily adopted by institutions. And when I say institutions, I mean mega institutions like prisons, like governments, like building complexes, such as you see here, right? And it didn't die out in the 50s and 60s, but it was at its height of popularity in the 50s and 60s. And this is the one I wanted to show you. These are, um, these are Soviet bus stops completed in the brutalist style. Um, and you see here that they kind of are evocative of something like a Japanese pagoda. Um, and they're meant to be kind of unworldly. They're meant to sit in the landscape in a way that is blunt, right? They're very crude. They're very geometric. They're very anti-landscape. They are very, very pro building and structure. Modernism as its core though, and I'm gonna nerd out for just a second about architecture. Modernism at its core, modernist architecture was supposed to be about um, simple clean lines that allowed for the landscape to be visible from within seamlessly. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in the plains of Illinois, right outside of Chicago, where high modernism was really about that. So like Philip, um, I think it's Philip Gla Gla the Glass House, Philip Johnson's The Glass House, um, is really just a box in the middle of nature, and you're meant to just see the forest, right? So brutalism took it and kind of like turned it on its head. Um, so, all right, that brings us to the assignment. Um, you're going to create a digital landscape um, in Illustrator um, using what you know now, and then what I'm going to teach you on Monday. Um, you are going to use only images from your campus. Now, your campus also has green space. You do not have to do a building. But I'm going to be real with you. You are on a campus. Well, you may not be on a campus right now, like I'm not on a campus right now. But you are literally on a historic campus. Once in a lifetime, you will never see this kind of like amalgamation and collection of brutalist architecture in one space at one time. I guarantee it. You won't see that unless you go to Russia and most of it's fallen down or they've knocked it down. So what you're going to do is either a green space or a, an architectural space, and it can be a close up. It can be far away. It's whatever you want. Um, you're going to take a bunch of images of photographs. We're going to do that on Monday. Um, you can use a combination thereof. It can be, it doesn't have to be entirely realist. So I'm going to let you kind of pick what style you want to choose. And hopefully, because I've recorded this, you'll maybe go back and you'll write down some artists that you liked. Hopefully you're already that student and you take great notes. Anywho, 
So you're going to use Illustrator. Uh, I'm going to show you how to trace images on Illustrator, and I'm going to show you how to color them in, an, in a little bit of a different way as well. But I want you to think about style specifically in this particular assignment. It can sort of venture into abstraction if that's what you're most interested in, but light really should be the feature um, and for middle and background. So I've got um, I've got so, you know some sort of inspirational images that are of course like something to aspire to as well. They're very very difficult to create. Um, and then I've got my um, uh, rubric here. So I'm grading you again your process sheet. Don't half-ass it, guys. Four points for this one is your process sheet. You're including um, your images that you you um, and I'll post this on Monday by the way. You're including the images that you worked with your photographs, your sketches, your drawing, if you're using a drawing as a foundation to start painting into with Illustrator. Um, you're talking about your inspiration, your stylistic inspiration and your historical inspiration. You need to put your foot in that process sheet, okay? Um, and then the other six points are creativity, technical skills, color, and visual impact. I'm gonna stop the share right now. Um, I, uh, do you want me to put that up now or do you want me to just wait until Monday so you guys can focus on the one you're doing now? Cause I, uh, some of you are done. Uh, you have a vote? I'm like almost done. I would say Monday though. I'd like it for just like reference if I do finish early. All right. I'll post it. Um, I'll make a little note to myself and I'll put it up now. Um, and you'll have two weeks. You'll have two weeks. Um, and some of you will blow through it really quickly, right? It depends on the approach that you have, how meticulous you want to be. Um, I'm not stacking a ton of technical things on you to know for Illustrator. I really want you to just sort of get the bare bones of Illustrator um, to be able to walk out with at least some competency in it. But some of you are a little more well-versed and are willing to kind of go the extra mile. So it's really up to you how, how much you put into it. Um, just know that sort of like you want to be thinking, and this wants to be on your radar here because Thanksgiving is next week. Okay. We don't spend a ton of time together because of these holidays and these things popping up. You want to be thinking about if you were to create any kind of animation, what that would be. You can do it in photo and I'll show you how to do it obviously through Photoshop or Illustrator, uh, or really any other device that you're comfortable with. You can do as much drawing as you want. It can be a repeating simple thing. It can be a really complex thing, but know that animations take a good long while. And you wanna start thinking about the skills that you've really enjoyed messing with and kind of like mastering this semester and building on that as the sort of foundation of whatever whatever kind of animation that you're gonna create for your final, okay? And you'll have until the very, very last day of your final. I'll give you until the final day of finals. So you have plenty of time. You'll have two weeks on this assignment, but they will, like, I want you to be able to manage your time smartly. So if you do move fast, you know, move on to the next assignment. Does that make sense? So I'll, I'll take questions if you got them. It's pretty self-explanatory and it'll be a nice celebration of, of your campus. All right, if you're out and about now, feel free to start taking photographs. Um, either way, I'll be kind of talking to you about um, the differences very quickly. It'll be like a 10 minute talk about the differences of images that you can use, starting with like, who's really afraid of Illustrator? Here's the simplest way to do this. Uh, and then who really wants to sort of put their foot in it and really expand and make a sort of really epic image. Okay. And what kind of, what kind of photographs to use? Does that make sense? But, Any qu yes. questions? I'll take them. I just had a technical question about Illustrator, but that can wait, right? Yeah, it can. I'm going to stop recording. Hold on. <laughs>